بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another episode of MYC podcast and in today's podcast I wanted to quickly talk about three major problems with the Quran only deviance I see a lot of youngsters these days I meet a lot of youngsters these days who it seems have slowly been falling a victim to the narrative that our deen islam is based on quran only alone there is no other source that we need for our deen and this is not a new narrative this deviance is not new it really started with the mu'tazila al mu'tazila the mu'tazilites they outwardly rejected everything else but the text of the quran um they are called ahlul bid'ah the minority a minority sect within islam that um uh, invented something new in deen which is to say the reliance on the text of the quran alone and there is not much problem with the concept per se but the problem with that is really when you divorce the text of the quran from its tradition from its from its historicity it becomes not only uh not any divine text it doesn't remain a text that's divine and has a tradition but it becomes just like any other work just like any other literary work for that matter of human beings that you can interpret to your whims and wishes to your own intellect according to your own intellect and that's really the problem with this narrative so the mu'tazilites they actually negated anything um um beyond the grasp of the five senses something that we can't see feel or touch or smell or hear for that matter they they uh, rejected it outwardly so they rejected everything supernatural now the very strange thing here is that the supernatural the supernatural is Allah almighty and as a muslim the first thing that you have to believe in is ghaib alif lam mim dhalika al kitab la rayb fi hudal lil muttaqin alladhina yu'minuna bil ghaib wa yuqimuna as salata wa mimma razaqnahum yunfiqun so the first thing is alladhina yu'minuna bil ghaib the ones who believe in the ghaib those are the mu'minin and so you really have to start begin with believing in the supernatural but the mu'tazilites the mu'tazila the main thing that they did with the religion was that they outwardly rejected anything that was supernatural that was not um let's let's say that was not outwardly rational that did not appear rational to them and they based this deviance on the text of the quran because they had to they they needed something to base their aqida upon to base their belief system upon and so to de- to deceive people they said because we believe in the quran only that is why we're going to take the uh, the verses of the quran the way we deem fit we're going to interpret the, these verses as we see fit and we will reject anything else we will reject the tradition because if they were to take into account the tradition accompanying the text of the quran obviously it has guidelines as to how you can interpret the ayat of the quran you have tafsir al quran bil quran then you have tafsir al quran bil ma'thur then you have tafsir al quran bil ra'i al mahmud and so you have an exegetical tradition a tradition which provides you with guidelines sound academic guidelines to how you can interpret the the words of the quran the text the sacrilegious text of the quran nas the text of the quran and 
um, it has um, a lot also to do with the explanations by the Prophet himself, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And so, if meaning of an ayah is fixed in a certain context, you can't just go and do an exegesis on your own, because that fixation, that framing, is oftentimes ninety-nine percent out of hundred. In fact, if it is fixed by a mutawatir hadith, one hundred percent, it is the framing of that exegesis the of that interpretation that you cannot do away with so we'll talk about this and we'll talk about much more in today's podcast inshallah so let's begin alhamdulillah alladhi anzal al-furqan wa ja'alahu huda lil-nas wa bushra lil-mu'mineen wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidil anbiya wal mursaleen وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المتطهرين وعلى أصحابه الراشدين المهديين وبعد three focal problems three focal problems with the Quran only deviants now if you are a Quran only youngster I would like you to listen and watch this podcast with an open mind and open heart and then if you have any questions you can always ask me and this podcast is really for my Sunni youngsters who oftentimes tend to fall a prey to this kind of narrative and when some of the confusions are brought up by, by the Quran only people because they are not well read because they haven't looked into it they fall a prey into um, uh, getting a false notion of oh but yeah they're right but what they are saying is right yeah what the Mu'tazila used to say was outwardly right I mean it, it seemed right and so if they talk to a lay person a lay Muslim a lay Muslim uh, if they went to a uh, awam they, they went to an amia they went to somebody who is uh, a very normal uh, a Muslim who's not well read and you know, talk to them about their aqaid, talk to them about their rational arguments, talk to them about their uh, 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 belief system. Those Muslims also fell a prey to saying, oh, but what they're saying is right. I mean, it seems right, right? I mean, if you go to somebody and say, isn't Allah's book complete? What What is the normal uh, lay Muslim gonna say no Allah's book is not enough <laughs> so you get my point right so okay let's look into the three focal problems with the Quran only deviance problem number one the problem of authority which is then intermixed with the problem of epistemology let me explain what that actually means the first thing that we need to concern ourselves with when we are talking about the Mu'tazila and the Quran only people because Quran only, Ahlul Quran are really progeny, intellectual progeny of the Mu'tazilites, right? So the first thing that we need to concern ourselves with when we are indulging into their narrative and when we are arguing with them or when we are looking at them as a deviant sect is whether they believe in the authority of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the messenger, final messenger of Allah or is their problem with the hadith is based upon the epistemological um, argument that the hadith has not reached us the way the Quran has reached us and so we cannot believe in the hadith and we will only believe in the Quran, right? Because Quran only means rejecting the hadith, right? You're saying you reject all tradition and you're just gonna take the Quran. So the rejection of the hadith, is it a rejection of the authority of the Prophet Wasallam? Are the Quran only saying that there is no authority but Allah's authority and we do not believe in any kind of authority other than Allah in the religion. And so that's why we're not going to take any hadith. Or is it that they're saying that because of the preservation problem, 
the hadith has not reached us in a manner that the Quran has reached us and Allah says in the Quran himself that the Quran is preserved that's why we can only believe that the Quran has reached us in a preserved manner in a preserved way and we can only believe in that we cannot believe in something that we don't know whether has reached us uh, without concoction or corruption or interpolation um, and that defeats in itself defeats the purpose of epistemological authority epistemological authentication because epistemology is really the the sources of knowledge the sources that you take your knowledge from so can you take knowledge from the hadith um, like you take knowledge from the Quran so when the Quran only say that no we're only going to take knowledge from the Quran are they saying it because they don't believe in any other authority than Allah or are they saying it because they don't believe that the hadith has reached us uh, in, 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 a, in a preserved way that the hadith is preserved and we can be 100% certain that these are the sayings of the prophets or these are the reports of the doings of the prophet so this is the first major problem of the um, Quran only sect that they confuse they are confused between the two when you reach uh, out to a Quran only um, uh, brother or sister and you ask them this question do we need to follow the messenger oftentimes they're going to say yes we need to follow the messenger and then they're going to turn around and say but the messenger has only um, promulgated the Quran he has only said whatever is in the Quran and so that is how we follow the messenger by following the Quran they're saying it uh, in a manner they're framing it in a manner which means that they have a problem with the authority of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so if we look into this um, matter um, in detail and and we go into a deep dive we do a deep dive into the Quran and we study the Quran the first thing that we learn about this is okay let's talk about the problem of authority for a minute of course no Muslim believes that there is any higher authority than Allah in the religion right the highest authority that we have is that of Allah so if Allah is the authority in the religion then we have to obey Allah's command, right? Whatever He decrees, we have to obey it. Sami'na wa ata'na. And so, when we look at the Quran, what we find out is that Allah is saying that you should obey the Messenger. So, if it is Allah's decree that we should obey, uh, the messenger and follow the messenger then the messenger has authority delegated by Allah Almighty himself let us look at for example Al-Ahzab Ayah 21 in which Allah says لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُو لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُو اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ A complete code of life has been given to you in the shape and form of the life of the Rasul, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so what is Allah telling us in this ayah? Allah is telling us that if you want to follow me, if you want to follow the Quran, you need to follow the Uswatun Hasana, the the complete code of life that is fi rasulillah that is embodied in the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and look at how many times allah says this to follow the messenger wa ma arsalna min rasulin illa li yuta'a bi'idnillah wa law annahum idh zalamu anfusahum ja'uka 
فاستغفروا الله واستغفر اللهم الرسول لوجد الله تواب الرحيم and we have not sent even a single rasul illa li yuta'a biznillah but that that rasul is to be followed biznillah because allah has decreed so nobody in islam nobody in the islamic world says that you have to uh, obey or follow anyone other than allah but allah is himself telling you to follow the messenger and so allah delegates this authority this this uh, this uh, status to his rasul himself and so allah says that every rasul had to be followed wa ma arsalna min rasulin illa li yuta'a bi'ithnillah now often times the quranists they do uh, take into account this ayah and they try to exegete it and frame it in a different manner but the point is the problem here is the next part of the ayah in which allah says wa law annahum idh-dhalamu anfusahum ja'uka allah says and so if they have done something wrong they come to you fastaghfirullah and they do istighfar they 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 beg for forgiveness from allah wastaghfirullahum ar-rasul and the rasul begs for forgiveness for them from allah la wajadullah tawwab ar-rahim only then will they find allah forgiving and merciful and so this clearly says this clearly tells you the role of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then this is by the way surah nisa ay 64 and then in surah surah al imran 32 allah says qul ati'u allah wa rasul fa in tawallaw fa inna allah la yuhibbu al kafirin then in al imran 132 wa ati'u allah wa rasul then allah says in surah an nisa ay 13 wa may yut'i allah wa rasulahu everywhere allah is saying Allah is saying obey Allah and the messenger obey Allah and the messenger ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu atiu Allah wa atiu rasula wa ulil amri minkum now the quranists point out oh but the ulil amr need to be followed as well well the point the 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 very important thing that they don't tell you ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu atiu Allah wa atiu rasul there is no atiu before ulil amr atiullah wa atiur rasul this is, has the same status the following of the allah has the same status the atiur rasul the following of the messenger these are on equal levels of authority in sharia in the following wa may yut'illah wa rasula fa ulaika ma'al ladina anama anama allah alayhim who has followed allah and the messenger man yut'i rasula faqad ata allah whomsoever follows the rasul he is the one who's following allah <coughs> this is an nisa 80 aya 80 wa ati allah wa ati rasul wahdharu ati allah wa rasulahu wa rasuluhu wa rasulahu wa ati allah wa rasulahu wa la tanaza'u ويطيعون ويطيعون الله ورسوله ولا ان اطعتم بشرا مثلكم انكم اذا لخاسرون اوكي ذس ايا اكشلي تيلز يو سمثينج فيري امبورتنت فارسلنا فيهم رسولا منهم ان اعبدوا الله ما لكم من اله غيره افلا تتقون اند وي سنت in them messenger from among them and the messenger told them ani'budullah only bow your head in front of almighty allah only worship allah ma lakum min ilahin ghayra there is no one else worthy of worship other than allah afala tattaqun so don't so aren't you fearful wa qala al malaa min qaumihi and there are people from that uh قوم uh, from that nation who said الذين كفروا the ones who did kufr وكذبوا بلقاء الآخرة and the ones who denied the hereafter وترفناهم في الحياة الدنيا and we have uh, made them an example in in this in this life ما هذا إلا بشر مثلكم this is just a human being like yourself يأكلوا 
mimma ta'kulun he eats like you wa yashrib wa yashrabu mimma tashrabun and he drinks like you wa lain ata'tum basharan mithlukum innakum idhalla khasirun so if you will follow a human being like you you will definitely be losers and this ayah tells you the main problem with the mu'tazilites and the quran only sect because they have a problem with the authority of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam this is very similar to these people whom allah made a an example out of who said this and i am really stunned why mu'tazilites and the quran only people they don't look at this ayah and and why then don't they realize oh we are doing something very similar like these kuffar we are taking the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a mere human being and so we have a problem with his authority you know the the prophets are different from the human beings because there is wahi upon them because allah sends revelation on them because allah reveals his divine knowledge to them innama ana basharum mithlukum yuha ilayya okay in surah nur 51 allah says innama kana qawl al qawl al mu'minina idh du'u ila allah wa rasulihi liyahkum liyahkum baynahum an yaqulu sami'na wa ata'na sami'na wa ata'na allah wa rasulihi idha du'u ila allah wa rasulihi when they are called towards allah and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they say sami'na wa ata'na we have heard and we obey we heard we obey wa may yut'i allah wa rasulahu wa yakhsha allah wa yattaqi fa ulaika hum al faizun whoever follows allah and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because he is fearful of allah he is fearful of allah fa ulaika hum al faizun they are the ones who are successful an nur 52 qul ati allah wa ati ar rasul obey allah and obey the prophet wa ati ar rasul in this ayah surah nur 56 the word allah isn't even there where is the word allah wa aqimu as-salata wa atu az-zakata wa ati'u ar-rasul la'allakum turhamun fattaqu allah wa ati'un fear allah and follow me okay here is another very interesting ayah al-ahzab 65 yawma taqallab yawma taqallab wujuhuhum wujuhuhum fin nari yaquluna ya laytana ata'na allah wa ata'na ar-rasul in nar in hereafter in 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 the hell fire they will say oh but we should have followed allah and the messenger and they would realize in hell fire <laughs> that following allah is not enough you have to follow the messenger because actually you follow the messenger that's how you follow allah wa man yut'i allah wa rasuluhu faqad faz fawzan azima ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu ati allah wa ati ar rasul wa man yut'i allah wa rasuluhu wa in tuti'u allah wa rasuluhu فاقم الصلاة وآت الزكاة وآت الله ورسوله وآت الله وآت الرسول وما أتاكم الرسول فقذوه وما نهاكم عنهم فانتهوا واتقوا الله إن الله شديد العقاب نا القرآن only people turn around and say the, that this ayah is only for the, was only for the time of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم I have a very quick question for them so إن الله شديد العقاب indeed Allah is very forceful in his uh, in his final judgment this is also just for the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and allah has ceased to be extremely staunch and uh, powerful in his uh, final judgment now so it was only for the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because when they exegete this ayah the quran only people this ayah says wa ma ataakum ar rasul fa khudhuhu whatever the rasul gives you take it wa ma nahaakum anhu fa antahu and whatever he prohibits you from you know stay away from it wattaqullah and fear allah 
and when they exegete this they say oh but this is only for the time of the prophet whatever he gave as in you know in ghanima in 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 uh, in, in the loot of the war or other stuff that is <coughs> that is what allah is saying that take it and whatever he doesn't give you don't take it you know stay away from it but my question here is allah says what taqullah and fear allah so that was only for the time of the prophet only in that time we muslims we needed to fear allah now we don't need to and in allah shadidul aqab that allah is extremely staunch in his final judgment that is th this 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 um, attribute of allah was only in the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam think about it the next ayah that we're going to look at is uh, again extremely extremely interesting fala wa rabbik fala wa rabbik la yu'minuna hatta yuhakkimuka fi ma shajara bainahum allah is telling blatantly fala wa rabbik beware la yu'minuna they will never become believers hatta yuhakkimuka unless they make you a judge fi ma shajara bainahum upon whatever is in dispute among them this is surah an-nisa 65 then in surah al-imran 164 allah says laqad manna allahu 'ala al-mu'minina idh ba'asa fihim rasulan min anfusihim yatlu 'alayhim ayatihi wa yuzakkihim wa yu'allimuhum al-kitab wal hikma wa in kanu min qablu lafi dalal mubin now here is one very quick question allah is telling you idh ba'asa fihim rasulan Allah has sent a messenger min anfusihim from among them into them yatlu alayhim ayatihi what does the messenger do yatlu alayhim ayatihi he recites the verses of Allah upon them wa yuzakkihim and purifies them wa yu'allimuhum al-kitab and teaches them the kitab wal hikmah and hikmah wa in kanu min qablu lafi dalal mubin my question is what does al hikma mean here because already allah has talked about the verses allah has talked about the kitab and we can take the kitab to mean al quran fine but what does the hikmah mean because there is a wow there is and the book and the hikmah so these two cannot be similar right these two cannot be one and same thing so what does hikma mean here qala shafi wa dhakar al hikma fa sami'tu man ardahu min ahli al ilm bil quran yaqul al hikmatu sunnatu rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in miftah al janna fil ihtijaj bis sunna there is a qaul of shafi rahimahullah there is a saying of shafi in which he says that hikma here in this ayah means sunnatu rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which is very logical uh okay so yeah qul in kuntum tuhibbun allah fattabi'uni yuhibbukum allah wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum wallahu ghafurur rahim say if you love allah fattabi'uni follow me the messenger is ordered to say allah is telling the messenger to tell the believers in kuntum tuhibbun allah if you love allah fattabi'uni follow me right so these were some of the ayat still some of the ayat in which allah has decreed that you follow the messenger so now that we have established that you have to follow the messenger if we have to how do we follow the messenger are his teachings separate from the quran so here is the point allah says in the quran laqad kana lakum fi rasulillahi uswatun hasana that you have a complete code of life 
in the form of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And surely, the whole life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not in the Quran, right? So, we need to understand that in order for us to follow the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We need some outside sources from outside the Quran to understand the way he lived his life or the things that he has said or done. I will talk about this in greater detail, inshallah. But for now, let's dwell into a an ayah in which Allah says, "Wama yantiqu an al-hawa in huwa illa wahyun yuha." that the Prophet وسلم, does not utter even a single word but what is revealed from Allah. In other words, saying that the life of the Prophet, the sayings of the Prophet, the doings of the Prophet, everything. It is a direct revelation from Allah Almighty. And so if that is the case, Where do we find those sayings? They are definitely not in the Quran because we have established and we all know that the Quran is the word of Allah. There can never be anybody else's words in the Quran, right? So if we have established it, we have established that in the Quran we cannot find the words or sayings of the Prophet wasallam. Where do we find them? This is the question of Wahi Matluf and Wahi Ghair Matluf. Allah says, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does not utter even a single word unless and until it is a direct revelation from us. Let me just write it here for you guys to look at. Wama Yantiku Anil Hawa In Hua Illa Wahyu Yuha. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam doesn't occur a single word. Wama yantiqwanil hawa. He doesn't say anything from his own accord. In huwa, unless it is illa wahyun yuha, unless it is revealed by us. So, really, the Quran then becomes the wahy al matluv. It it becomes the revelation that we recite the wahyi that the revelation recitation of which is ibadah recitation of which is an act of worship but then there has to be the wahyi the revelation that is not in the quran right because wama yantiqu anil hawa in huwa illa wahyun yuha the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam does not utter anything from his own accord from his own whims and wishes but what is revealed on to him. So the Prophet ﷺ must have said other things than the Quran in his lifetime, right? That is the simple logical inference. I mean, in his earthly life of 63 years of age and 23 years after the beginning of the revelation, since he was 40, 40 to 63, 23 years, in those 23 years, he must have said stuff that is not the Quran right that is a simple logic that is a simple logical inference and so that wahyi because everything is wahyi from Allah whatever the Prophet does and says so that wahyi becomes the wahyi ghair matluf it becomes the wahyi that is not recited so This is the question really. If indeed we are to follow the Prophet وسلم, and we have just seen that we have to, how are we to know for certain about what he said or what he did? So this very point brings us to the next problem which is really connected 
to this point all of these problems are connected together the so second problem is the problem of reality now here is a very strange problem that you find with today's quran only people they somehow tend to create in a confusion and tend to confuse people by saying that the Quran alone is enough, whatever is in Quran we believe, whatever is not in the Quran we don't believe, as in trying to divorce religion and the Quran from the reality, from the physical reality that we live in. We are created into this physical world, which is governed by the laws of nature, physics, maths, chemistry, biology, etc. And Allah says in the Quran himself, لا تبديل لخلق الله That this world, the way we have created it, cannot change. <coughs> what that means really is that no one can defy the physical reality of the world. Allah says in, this, in, in, in Surah Rahman, reiterating upon the fact, يا معشر الجن والإنسي إن استطعتم أن تنفذوا من أقطار السماوات والأرض فانفذوا لا تنفذون إلا بالسلطان. أو يا معشر الجن والإنس أو جن and إنس أو ج أو جنس and human beings. If you think you can defy the boundaries of this physical world, go ahead and try. لا تنفذون إلا بالسلطان. You won't be able to do it. But if Allah wills, and how much Allah wills. <coughs> so yeah. So religion is revealed for this world, for us, for human beings. And Allah has, say, has said multiple times in the Quran, we have created heavens and earth, we have created the Jabal, the mountains. We make it rain on the earth to rejuvenate it. Um, we have created the shajar, the trees and the grass and the and, and the and the tayr and then the the um, the um, the birds that fly. So Allah all the time in the Quran points us towards the physical reality, and then Allah says, "Ayatin li ulil al bab." In all of this, there are signs for the ones who are intellectually endowed, who try to work hard int intellectually, who try to think about these things. <laughs> Don't they sit down and think about this empirical reality? And so Allah has times and again told us about this physical reality. Allah has revealed this religion in this very reality that we are grounded in. And to say that the Quran is something divorced from this reality is really as illogical as it could be right and and generally speaking by the way the quranists have very little to do with rationality and logic so <laughs> so yeah so this quran was revealed in uh in this physical world it was revealed to a human being, the Prophet ﷺ, because let's look at it this way. Allah says in the Quran, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ فَلَا تَضْرِبُوا لِلَّهِ الْأَمْثَالِ There is nothing similar to Allah and do not strike examples for Allah. <coughs> so when we say that the Quran is Kalamullah, that the Quran is the word of Allah, it is the speech of Allah. What do we really mean by that? Does Allah speak Arabic like we hear from the Saudis or the Masri people? Does he speak in the in the uh, dialect of Masr like saying Izayak? Or does he speak in the dialect of the Saudis like saying Kifhalik? Or the Lebanese who say Shushbek? So, I mean, definitely no one believes that Allah speaks like human beings, right? So what does it mean when we say this is Kalam Allah? That this is Allah's word. Has anyone ever heard Allah speak? I mean, Musa alayhi salam um, 
had the privilege of listening to whatever Allah revealed on to him but we don't really know what were the schematics of 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 this uh, dialogue as it were and so allah says in the quran qul man kana aduwan li jibril fa innahu nazzalahu ala qalbika bi idhnillah allah tells us that allah has revealed the quran unto the heart of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam through jibril alaihi salam we don't know the reality of of the quran we don't know the reality of the speech of allah we don't know the reality of how allah speaks <coughs> what we know is what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has told us so if the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said alhamdulillah rabbil alamin we say alhamdulillah rabbil alamin we need to understand this very important central point because this is something that the quranists run away from this is something that they don't want to talk about because this central point makes their house of cards fall fall apart really they don't have any legs to stand upon the quran is revealed to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who is who was a living breathing human being living in the physical world of his time and it has a historical tradition that is around it it did not come down as a book as a pdf allah says wa qala alladhina kafaru law nunzila alayhi alquran jumlatan wahidatan allah says this very thing allah says that the ones who do kufr the ones who are non muslims they said law la nunzila alayhi alquran if the quran would have um descended upon the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam jumlatun wahidatun like all at once like a book you know why did it not come down on the prophet as a book this is what the non believers say all the time it was not revealed as a book to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it was not sent down as a book to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it was not sent down all at once allah says kadhalika linuthabbita bihi fuadak wa ratsalnahu tartila yes indeed <coughs> we have revealed this way in parts linuthabbita bihi fuadaka so we can strengthen your heart with it wa ratsalnahu tartila and we have revealed it to you in bits and pieces gradually ratsalnahu tartila then allah says inna alaina jam'ahu wa qur'ana and this is a very important point nowhere allah says that we have revealed the quran and we will preserve it allah says inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun and i'll come to that in a minute allah says inna alaina jam'ahu wa qur'ana what allah says is that this quran he has taken upon himself that he will uh bring it all together in the prophet's heart sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa qur'ana and its recitations fa idha qara'nahu fattabi' qur'ana so allah says when we have revealed its recitations fattabi' qur'ana follow its recitations thumma inna alayna bayana then we will promulgate it so coming to inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun often times the quran only people they point towards this ayah and say see we don't need to talk about the preservation of this document because allah says in the quran himself inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun we have revealed the dhikr and we will protect it but here is the point this is the deviance this is the lie and and most of like all of the quran only people they are liars really they lie upon the quran there is nowhere the word quran in this ayah the word here is dhikr adh-dhikr 
<coughs> and it could be translated as message that is like the most obvious translation of the word dhikr that we have revealed the message and we will guard our message and this also includes the previous uh, books that were revealed by Allah Almighty but we'll come to that in detail in a minute let's first talk about then what really is the Quran the Quran really is oral tradition we don't know how it was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we don't know the schematics we don't know how Allah speaks we only know what the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us what the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught his companions and what the companions taught their companions so on and so forth so it's an oral tradition from the Prophet to us right that is the historicity of this document it was revealed in a historical context at that point in time in the Arab it was not sent on WhatsApp to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a PDF that he could print on desktop printed and then distribute among the Sahaba right it was orally transmitted from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to his companions to their companions to their companions and so on and so forth now the Quran today is recited in more than one ways so I mean if you're saying that the Quran is preserved because Allah says inna lahu la we are the ones who protect it then why are these differences there that exist today for example alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen ar-rahman ar-rahim malik yawm ad-deen and ar-rahman ar-rahim malik yawm ad-deen <coughs> then takthibun and yakthibun and then there are so many other examples taha tahi wadduha wadduhi and not just in usul but also in farshul huruf there are words that are different more than 40 words that are different in different qiraat in the whole of the quran so what is an explanation of that if you look at the birmingham quran manuscript for example i mean quran is also say oh, we have manuscripts dating back to the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to the time of uthman ibn affan radiyallahu anhu okay fine but in those codexes for example the birmingham codex is probably from the time of of the third caliph uthman ibn affan radiyallahu anhu if you look at that codex there is no ajam or tashkeel like the word is written like this there is no ajam or tashkeel on that word it's just a skeleton a skeletal text now this is the uh, arab the language arabic is from lugat samia semitic languages all semitic languages can be read differently if there are no ajam or tashkeel on them it is the same with the bible the current bible that we have the one that is translated into english is called masoretic bible the tanakh the masoretic bible is called the masoretic bible now that today that the bible that we have is called masoretic bible because it was recited in a certain way by the masoretic society i don't know these were two brothers i think who fixed the qira'ah of of this bible or something i don't i don't exactly recall but you can look it up even wikipedia has an article about this and so it's it's qira'ah its recitation is fixed if there are no ajam or tashkeel on a semitic language you can read it differently so my question is that in birmingham codex for example in birmingham quran manuscript for example the other codexes that we have if there are no ajam or tashkeel how would how do we read certain words a certain way today how that is the oral tradition right 
So those are the qiraats. Okay, let me make this very simple to you. Show me a codex of the Quran from earlier Quranic manuscripts. So I'm not talking about the later Quranic manuscripts because that those cannot really be carbon dated back to the time of the Prophet or the time of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the time of uh, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an. I'm talking about a manuscript that can be carbon dated back to the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or back to the time of the third Caliph radiallahu anhu and show me empirically, logically, rationally how those skeletal words and why those skeletal words are read a certain way today, the way we are reading the Quran today and differently. So in that manuscript, for example, I talked about Birmingham Quran manuscript. You, on the on the latter half of of uh, the second page on the left, there's Surah Taha that is written. So the word is written as this. Now this can be read, and let me write it here. So this can be read as Taha Taha. If there is no ajam or tashkeel on this, it can also be read as tahu. What is stopping me in reading this word, this skeletal word without ajam or tashkeel as tahu? This is the question that I'd pose to uh, any Quranist that they have no answer to. So let's uh, let's move on. So how today do we uh, empirically prove with 100% certainty that the Quran is preserved through oral tradition. Without the oral tradition, which is really the snad criticism, we don't have an authentic Quran. And this very oral tradition is at the basis of hadith as well. So this brings us to the third problem, the contradiction of historicity. When the above discussion concludes in rational empirical terms that the oral tradition is the basis of our religion and both Quran and Hadith are authenticated through this very oral tradition, which is a snath criticism, the most confusing and elusive problem arises. This is where the Quran is said that the Quran is preserved because Allah says so, but the Hadith is not preserved and so we cannot and will not take Hadith. This is quite deceiving. The first thing is, when you say that the hadith is not preserved, you are talking about history, right? So, when you are talking about hadith, you are asking for a historical proof, right? But, same is then not applied to the Quran? This is very important actually, that's why I, I, I wrote it on the side here. <coughs> See, when we talk about this to a Qurani, they would say, oh, but the, but the hadith is not preserved. How can you prove authentically that the hadith is preserved. Well, how can you prove authentically that the Quran is preserved? Oh, but Allah says so. But you are not saying that for the hadith. <coughs> Allah says, نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا ذِكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ The message of Allah is preserved. And so the message of Allah is in hadith as well. So the hadith is preserved by that standard too. Right? But when you're talking about hadith, you're not talking about that. You're talking about the historicity. You ask for a proof that is historical. And, and it, that's a pertinent question. That's a valid question. Proving the authenticity of the hadith through isnath criticism. That is what the academia does. But here are the double standards. Now these are the double standards of the Quranist really. the double standards okay so this is behaving a little odd normally it doesn't do that um, double standards okay um, 
so the double standards of the Quranists here are to be noted and this is something that is extremely deceiving and something that they do a lot of times and times and time again for hadith they have a historical standard they want historical proof but for the Quran they try to divorce it from reality and try to make it into something into something supernatural the Quran was revealed to a human being and it has come down to us really in a similar fashion that the hadith has come down to us in at their base at their base level they both share the same thing this is not criticism the oral tradition there are definitely differences between this not criticism of the Quran and this is not criticism of the hadith obviously but the point is that the base is the same it's it's all about who has heard from whom and who has heard from whom and who heard from whom and who heard from whom and were the suduq or what were the kadhab you know that were the siqa the jarh and ta'adil this is called ilm asma rajal so anyways this is something that i uh, wanted to point out and i wanted to especially point out to my youth so they could be aware of this so let's ask the quranist if the hadith were proven to be preserved now here is a very tricky question <coughs> to the quranists going back to the origin going back to the beginning of uh, this whole discourse let's ask the quranists if the hadith were proven to be preserved would they take it they will reply no the quran is enough well the quran is enough whereas we have just proved above that it is said by Allah himself in the Quran to obey and follow the messenger Quran is indeed enough and complete but to see it in action you need the actions and sayings of a human being it is not in contradiction to the divine text now there is something called hadith absolutism some sects in al sunnah wal jamaah and these are in in minority <coughs> say that we will have to take hadith even if a hadith a daif hadith or a or a sahih hadith which is not mutawatir is in direct contradiction with the text of the quran we still need to take the hadith this is called hadith absolutism this is the point of view of a minority this is not something that ahl sunnah wal jamaah that the sunni creed generally adheres to <coughs> so that's besides the point secondly nowhere does Allah says that he has revealed the Quran and he will preserve it the word used is a dhikr like I talked about before which roughly means the message we believe in all books revealed by Allah and we believe that this message is preserved in whichever way shape or form he has revealed it so if we go by this logic Quran's words do not need to be preserved right because the dhikr the message is preserved not <coughs> the words themselves <coughs> so the Quran only do not believe that the Quran is kalam Allah so it is not the word of Allah and is not preserved this is the conundrum this is the ditch that the Quranists have dug for themselves when Allah says inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun Allah is saying we have revealed the message and we will preserve it so that message is preserved throughout the history of humankind what does that have to do with the Quran itself and so if you're saying <coughs> that you believe that the message is preserved and not, not the Quran so you in other words you're saying that it's not kalam Allah that it doesn't need to be preserved that's a huge problem right so just to demonstrate the absurdity of their claim that the Quran is enough Quran is enough Quran is enough I mean Quran is enough but obviously because it was revealed onto the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and because Quran itself says and Quran itself says 
لقد كان لكم في رسول الله يسوة حسنة that there is a complete code of life in the life of Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم for you to follow that is the reason why this has a tradition the tradition of the Sahaba who were taught by the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم the way they lived their lives we can look at those we can learn from those those lives and those those uh, those ways that they indulged into for example the way you eat the way you do other stuff the the way you do ma'amla the way you live in 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 an, an, an islamic society you have to form an islamic society you need a tradition to base your islamic society upon right just the book which is enough just the book alone without its practice it cannot be implemented into your life so <clears throat> for example i have some uh, very quick things to for you to look at salah every single qurani that i have met they differ upon this some of them don't even believe that this means prayer the ritual prayer the way we perform it they believe there is just prayer praying to allah and when we talk about qiyam they say that this should be uh, aqimu salah because it is said aqimu salah so they say well that means that you should really implement it in your life so it's really strange some of them believe in three ritual prayers some of them believe in two one and so they differ amongst themselves on 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 the ta'addud on the on the actual numbers of the ritual prayer and that's really a mockery of islam right you made a mockery of the religion <coughs> then some there are many quranists that i have talked to who like 80% of quranists that i have met and i have talked to don't even believe that this is about fasting or that there even is a fasting month in islam where do we get the fasting month from from the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then zakat 99% of the quranists they don't believe in zakat like we do like it's 2.5 percent of uh, of your savings uh you know it's it's really it's a mockery of 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 the of of the religion hajj the pilgrimage <laughs> no no qurani i have met today who believes in in the in in the ritual of pilgrimage the way it is meant to be performed there is some of them believe in going to kaaba some of them believe believe in in uh, visiting kaaba and just you know tawaf like like umrah no one from the quranist camp believes in any of this in any of the rituals really this is this is kufriya kufriya this is kufr kufr five pillars of islam and you have done away with each one of them okay on to the lighter stuff a bit lighter a notch lighter still extremely important pivotally important istimna bil yad masturbation show me where it is prohibited in the quran okay show me where it is decreed that you need to take a ghusl after janaba that you need to take a complete <coughs> <coughs> shower of whole body after you have committed coitus with your spouse show me where it is in the quran nikah saghira show me where it is prohibited to marry children in the quran hatta balaghun nikah can mean any age of nikah that a society comes together upon hatta balaghun nikah this is the ayah that is quoted by these uh, quranists in reply to this this does not prohibit anyone any muslim from marrying a child in fact in the ayah in another ayah the, the the main pivotal ayah it is said allah lam yahid marry the ones um, uh, it's talking about divorce you can divorce the ones who um, have their menstruation period so they're 
period of idza, their period of mourning will start after their their menstrual cycle or something along those lines. I'm forgetting the exact contents of, of that ayah. You can look it up. But then it says, And the ones who have not yet menstruated, So Quran, in fact, is talking about divorcing children which in turn means that you have married children who have not yet menstruated and now you're divorcing them so where does in quran it is prohibited to marry a child then in quran it is written marratan, the divorce is twice then imsakum bil ma'roof then then you take them back or you let them go how is a system of three divorce derived from this ayah I want to know. <coughs> I really, really, really want to know. As somebody who knows Arabic. Salaqum marratan. Marratan, yani, khalas. Imsakun bil ma'roof badi, yani, wa huwa salaq, aidan. The third, uh, the, thir- the second part of the ayah, then that is taken to be the third divorce if you let them go or you take them back. If you take them back, then that's two divorces. And the third one is yet reserved. So that is called ba'ina. غَيْرُ مُغَلَّضَ Right? How is that derived from the ayah itself? If you are a Quran only, show me. How do you derive the masail of talaq from the ayat of the Quran themselves. I want to really, really see you do it. Then there is a very um, a blatant ayah in the Quran, um, a muhkam ayah in the Quran, and it's غير متشابه, in which Allah says, الزاني لا تنكح إلا الزانية, that the zani, the one who has fornicated, cannot marry anyone but the zaniya. So, my simple question to the Quranists is, the one who commits fornication cannot marry anyone other than the one he has committed fornication with, right? So, what would be the hukm, a shari? What would be the ruling for that man if he marries somebody else? Would that nikah that he does with somebody other than uh, the one that he has already committed fornication with, would that nikah be validated or not? So these are some of the things that I really want you to dwell into and understand. The youth of, of my Sunni creed. How do you derive this from the Quran without the example of the life of the Prophet wasallam? The life of the Prophet is the Quran itself. He implemented the Quran in his life. And he showed us how it could be implemented practically. So let me finish this podcast here today. And uh, I just wanted to do this on uh, on paper, as it were, on digital paper. And uh, yeah, I guess this format would help you to concentrate on the written word and dwell into it more than just, you know, looking at uh, my ugly mug shot <laughs> that way so in any case let's finish this here if you have any more questions you know shoot and i will try and answer them in the best of the manners inshallah alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh ma alayna illa al